Okay. Thank you for reading with me. All right, let's pray. God, we wait on you. We open our hearts. We welcome you. Lord, you said that we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. We come in to your gates with praise. So we open our hearts to you, God. Offering you thanks, offering you praise, and welcoming you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's get ready to stand and worship. I just want to say I'm very grateful to have already said hi and spoken to two um, visitors this morning. I hope that everybody gets to look out and just introduce themselves and help them feel welcome. Um, we're going to just love God this morning and our praise and our worship. Let's just pour it out to him. can't separate even if I ran away your love never fails I know I still make mistakes but you have new mercy for me every day your love never fails You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. strong and the water's deep, but I'm not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage i don't have to be afraid because i know that you love me your love never fails. Make all things work to our good. All things work together for my good. You know so much more than us, God. You made all things work together for my good. And we love you. You made all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rain, to be afraid because I know that you love me your love never fails you make all things work together for my good 
you make all things work together for my good. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah, roaring with power, is fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him.
that you guide us in each moment to worship you in your Holy Spirit, in the truth of your word. Pray a blessing over the reading of your word, God, and the teaching this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can go upstairs. Oh, good, that's working. Audra, you any good at catching? <laughs> uh, so I always do my sermon prep on Sunday. You hear that echo, right, James? Yeah, the week before. I don't mean this morning. I do it after church <laughs> the previous week, um, which always makes it really funny when uh, Kim will be doing the bulletin. It's like, none of your notes are in plain center. It's like, I put them in four days ago. I really don't like that program sometimes because it doesn't save stuff. Um, and go on hand, I was like, man, this is good. Um, just really feeling like this is a nice next step in knowing uh, the next couple weeks of where this is going with what Jesus said. And man, we are really running hot back here. <laughs> And so, I, I was ready for this. And then this week just continued, and it was like God was orchestrating something well, well, well beforehand. And uh, it'll make sense we go further into the sermon. It doesn't fit with the first point. Uh, some parts of me are just like wanting to abandon like half the sermon and just talk about the end of it. But... If it was true when I searched out for God last Sunday and he knew what he was going to do the rest of the week, that means it was, I still need to preach the rest of it. Um, I know some pastors say, God gives me a message at the last moment and that's what I got to preach. And it's like, I've had those moments, but I'm a firm believer. If God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow, and I was firmly praying and listening, you know, several days beforehand, then there was no reason to change it. I'm just having something. So we read uh, what actually would be the last passage of what uh, this sermon's going to be, and we're going to have a couple other ones, but the first point you guys are going to have, I do not actually have in my notes the scriptural basis for it because Jesus never said it. He just did it. Uh, there was times when Jesus had a whole bunch of healing and miracles, and he would, would preach long sermons, and then we'd have these little notes that he went off.
people say, do you want me to use my handheld instead? Oh, okay. might wake up where you don't want to. Okay. All right. Now can everybody? Good. So it's about waiting on God in your rest. You can do anything to do that. Uh, years ago, actually now we're in like a, over a decade ago, uh, there was a group of Mormons that were convinced they were going to save me and Kim and we would be baptized by them, um, which was really hard not to laugh when they said that to us. But one of the times we were talking and they said, well, we know you're, you guys are wrong because you never rest. You'll do stuff on Sunday and that's not resting. And I was like, do you consider weightlifting resting. And they're like, no, because you're lifting a heavy object. And I was like, so somebody that finds their peace and can connect with God by lifting heavy objects, that's not rest. And they're like, no, because they're, they're lifting something and it's heavy. I was like, you do not understand rest then, or people, one of the two. I was like, what about digging up a garden and putting it in new plants? Would that be rest for someone? And they're like, no, they're doing work. I was like, man, you must have never gardened them. They, they were young guys too, so uh, maybe they had never gardened. But I listed a whole bunch of things where they were like that fine line between work and rest, and none of them could they see how that's rest. They're like, rest means you go to church, and then you go home. And I think when they brought the elder with, they brought it back up, and he basically made it sound like, and then you time travel back to Little House on the Prairie and turn off all your lights and everything and just sit in darkness. And I'm like, that's not restful. Like, if that was what I had to do, the way my neurodivergent brain works, man, my anxiety would probably spike through the roof so stinking much, I'd scratch a hole through my arm if you told me on Sunday, it's you do this, and then you sit at home in the darkness. But rest is you find this way to commune and wait for God. That's why we have to have these moments where we wait and rest. And I love how so many of the examples of Christ in this are him just going off very early in the morning and praying. He took his time to wait and rest before he started. And then he was refreshed and able to do everything he needed to do. Whereas most of us do it in the exact opposite. We wake up groggy. We hope the coffee works. And if the first one doesn't work, we hope by at least the fourth it's working. What's that? No, no, you figured it out. You just get the one really big cup. <laughs> and then we run ourselves ragged the whole day and hope we did enough that we can turn off our minds and not go, okay, I have like this to do, this to do, this to do, this to do, and go to sleep at such a level of exhaustion that it's like you hit the bed and you're gone. And we think, when we hit the bed, that's rest. That's not rest. That's effectively doing the same thing we do to our computer when it's not working right and turning it off and on again. We know it'll work again in the morning if we go to sleep. Rest is this time where you connect with God. And because of the awesomeness of free will and the individuality that he gave to each of us, Rest and communicating with God will look different for everyone. And, like, just for the ridiculousness of this, parents, you should disciple in this, but if your teen or kid, their way to rest after the whole week of us jamming as much information into their brain as possible is to unplug and 
play a video game, that's rest. You just need a disciple. I was like, all right, how do we take you doing Rainbow Six and hunting down some zombies? zombie Nazis and connect that back to God. I do not have that answer for you, but it was just the most ridiculous video game. I'm betting you get there quicker through Mario, but that's just my choice. You know, Jesus crushed the serpent with his heel. As Mario, you crushed the mushroom with yours. I don't know if that was heresy or not, but... <laughs> find your way to rest and everybody it's going to be different but focus in whatever that activity is that you are resting how is it waiting on God how is it going to give glory to God and obviously there are some things that if you're like I'm going to do this for rest you got to like check yourself and go there's no way to give glory to God in this it's just not going to happen if you think your way to rest is, man, I feel like I'm picking on something a little bit with this, but, you know, binge watching Game of Thrones. Unless you have Angel Vid censoring everything, I really don't see how you're going to give glory to God in that with some of the content in it. Find your way to rest and then measure it against this idea. Can I give glory to God? Can I wait for God in this? And when those two things come together, that's when it's really rest. The next thing here, we're going to flip to Mark chapter 16, verses 6 through 7. And if you're freaking out at the back, that's because it wasn't in Planning Center. I'm just reading it. Do not be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Uh, some of the translations in, uh, say, go to Galilee and wait for him there. Uh, all means the same thing. We tell people so often, you can meet Jesus anywhere because Jesus is anywhere and everywhere. But there are legitimately times where you have to wait for Jesus. That you have to wait for this moment, this encounter he is setting up for you. And... Sometimes that will include a place. Uh, I cannot remember his name for the life of me. Now, he writes my favorite books on prayer and the subject, and he talks about um, in one of his stories how he was really engaging in prayer. He wanted to do this so well, and he was praying once, and God said, hey, go to this cafe that is like two hours away from where he lives. So he found a friend to borrow their car because he lives in London. Like, next to nobody has a car because you're inside the city. You just walk everywhere, take the bus, drives to this cafe, and sits there. And, like, politely asks for a coffee because he figures, well, I'm here. I'm not going to be here that long. I came to where God said, so I'm going to be here. And an hour goes by. And he decides, okay, well, apparently I'm going to be here longer. I'll order a little more. And he talks politely to the waitress. He stays for six hours, like two different waitresses switch shifts on him. And nothing happens. And he goes home a little discouraged, trying to figure out, I was like, God, I heard you clearly when I prayed, go to this cafe and wait for me. And he's like, and nothing happened. And he's like, and I couldn't figure it out the whole drive home. But I get home, go into prayer, and I prayed about something else. And immediately it happened. And I had to discuss this with other people. And he's like, yeah, you don't get it, do you? God just wanted to make sure you would go to that place. He wanted to make sure you were listening so that for the next prayer, 
you would know exactly what to do, and he could answer it. Now, personally, I really wish I could say I have enough faith that when God, I'm positive God tells me, go do something like that, and if he left me waiting there, I would be right back into it. I'm pretty sure I'd be eventually back into it. I know my emotional scale enough that I'm like, I'd probably be fuming that whole car ride home and start, you know, paraphrasing some of David's more uh, grumpy psalms. Because what was going on there? Nothing happened. But sometimes we have to wait for Jesus. And he gave this example right here to all of his followers. Just go and wait for me. And... They actually do this. They go and wait for him in Galilee and try and get in their mindset. They're taking the word of some women here, which I know that sounds incredibly sexist right now, but you got to remember women back then, you couldn't even use them as a witness in court because that's what their place and value was. Just told them Jesus is alive and go and wait in Galilee. While they have seen people resurrected, who were resurrected before? None of them were resurrected from anything like a crucifixion, let alone one that even back then they knew was one of the most brutal, brutal crucifixions of all time. Like, I can only imagine that some of the apostles that were within the realm of watching it were going, I think you remember saying he was going to come back as things were happening. And like as each thing happened, go, I'm not sure if I believe that anymore. But we know they went and waited for him in Galilee. They waited for him to show up. And if you're having an inkling of, I know God is drawing me for something. And maybe there's a specific word that's for somewhere. Just go. Do it. Go with that inkling. Even if you're like, man, it might just be some weird voice in my head. If you're saying, I'm doing this for God, even if it's a weird voice in your head, he's going to go, oh, they're doing this for me and honor it. Now, keep in mind, like, I've said that line to a teen before, and they're like, the voice in my head tells me to light fires. I'm like, that's not a voice in your head you listen to. There was never God doing that. Um, If he's telling you to go somewhere, that's probably accurate. If he's telling you to talk to somebody, share the gospel, definitely accurate. Burning down things. (sighs) Double check that with an elder. Um, there's a good chance we might need to get you in therapy. But there's times where Jesus just says, wait. And I think in the frustration of our day and age with so much going on, we haven't actually heard Jesus saying, wait. And we've been so desperate for things to happen lately that we haven't heard Jesus wait. Or say, wait. And we try and manufacture things. And when we manufacture things, some stuff does happen. Uh, There's a whole ethos that's going to be one of your big words here, because I'm going to use a bunch, of drama and stage. They call it the hermatia. It's a Latin word that basically means the emotional journey you take someone on. And churches, speakers, everybody uses it. Even Billy Graham uses it. I actually got really annoyed when I found out he did this and then realized it actually makes a lot of sense from a psychological perspective. Um, For those who are my age and older, um, you guys remember watching the Billy Graham revivals, right? Like, they used to interrupt TV shows. That's how big they were. 
And when you get to the, they're singing just as I am, and you see these crowds of people coming down to the altar. 50 to 80% of the first people that you see walking were planted there by the Billy Graham organization because they realized people tend to be scared to be the first one. So they provided the first one so everybody else could go freely. So that they, they broke that fear barrier. And like I said, I was really annoyed the first time I f- figured that out because I was like, man, that's manipulative. But then when I you know, understood what they were doing, I was like, no, that makes sense. I've never done it before. I've never had a crowd big enough where you wouldn't notice if I was doing it. But we need to wait for Jesus, not manufacture Jesus. And, man, pastors, we are so guilty of this one. That we are so anxious for Jesus to show up, for the change to happen, that we don't want to wait. And usually that's when we make mistakes. Not the ones where, you know, we do something wrong, but we're the ones where uh, one of the pastors I love listening to right now in his podcast talks about how in his first church he was trying to do a turnaround, and after six months of nothing happening, He got angry. He's like, I don't even remember what the sermon is. But I basically unloaded on them from some passage in the Bible and told them it's all your fault that nothing's changed. And he's like, I'm so glad I'm older and wiser now to know I was the idiot in that, not them. It wasn't their fault nothing changed. It was my fault because I didn't wait for Jesus in the moment he was ready to change things. A lot of our frustration right now is because Jesus is saying, wait. And we don't want to wait. Like, has anybody ever had that moment where you're cooking something in the microwave and you read the package? You know, like after the third time, you've already thrown it in the trash to remember what did it actually say. And then you start trying to do math and go, I really want this hot pocket in like 10 seconds. So if I turn up the temperature to this level and reduce the time, this will work because I don't want to wait. I have only actually done that once. I learned my lesson the first time. If I turn the power up on the microwave that much that I can do it in 10 seconds, it just blows up. And then I have no hot pocket and I'm going to wait because I have to now clean the microwave and cook another one. Same thing happens in life. If Jesus is saying, wait, and he's giving a moment of wait, and you try and force it faster, it blows up. I warn the board beforehand that you need to have the ability to say no to me because in my passion for evangelism and in my inability to wait, I will steamroll over all of you and grow a church, but you might not like what happened. And they've been pretty good about telling me no every now and again. There's probably still a few more times they should have told me no, but (laughs) they understood it. And because of that, I fully know this church has grown healthier because it's been a group project, not just me steamrolling over everybody. Does make me itch, though, every now and again, because I'm like, man, there's so much more I could be doing, but I'm like, no, I got to wait. I got to wait. In this weekend, of all things, I'm positive is becoming the end of waiting for something. This weekend, uh, tonight, is the Super Bowl. If you've somehow missed that, that means you probably are slightly, you know, more restful than I am and just don't watch anything ever because, like, They produce this thing for everyone. And I know, man, I am impressed with Satan in the trick he pulled on Christians with football in the last five years. Because one person, which honestly, I don't know if he was doing it out of honesty or to save his career, but 
He takes a knee, that whole thing spreads, and you got a bunch of Christians going, well, we love Jesus, but we also love our country, and you've insulted our country, so we are abandoning football. Well, at the same time, the number of people that have been baptized, saved, come to Christ, actively praying, and I don't mean like, hey, they're praying off on the sidelines. I mean, when they get to the press conference, they are sharing the gospel with all the reporters that don't get it, has been escalating year after year. That football teams will find out, hey, our rival team is in the hotel across the street after having a prayer thing. Go over, knock on their doors and go, hey, can we pray with you? And then they take over the pool and then they baptize a whole football team. This has been going on in the NFL the last five years. And for most of the time, all I hear from Christians are, I'm going to burn my jersey because this person said this. And I'm like, really? Well, if you burn that guy's jersey, please buy five of this guy's jersey because that's how many people he led to Christ from the other team. All this has been going down, and it's been culminating this year. We saw this um, just a month ago. Uh, when the, I can't even remember his name, and I've read it so many times from the Buffalo Bills, literally the play ends, he drops pretty much dead. They weren't expecting him to get up. And both teams run and start praying over him. Commentators actually said, we're used to somebody getting injured on the field and the team's taking knees in respect. That's normal football practice. Like, I've seen it from high school to college to uh, NFL, the other pro leagues. They're like, we heard what was in there. They were praying in the name of Jesus that he would get back up. The players that got interviewed over started sharing the gospel anytime the mic was on them, saying that we believe in the name of Jesus, that we prayed over him. He's getting back up. We had a retired player go on and, like, try and explain this. And he was like, this is the only way I can explain this to you. Do you know where you're going to go when you're going to die? And then shares the gospel. We had broadcasters go, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. I might lose my job from doing this, but I'm going to pray live now on air. And if you don't understand that, that's fine. But if you do, I want you to pray with me. And tonight... In the first time that I can remember, and maybe some of you guys can remember back further, but not once but twice, the gospel is going to be shared during the Super Bowl because a whole bunch of Christians got together and said, we have money. We do not like where culture is going. We do not like that every time it's making the news and making media. It is just putting Jesus' name down, and they're choosing the worst of us to be the example. We want something there to prove that the message of Jesus is real. And so two commercials are playing during the Super Bowl that are going to share the gospel. Guys, we prayed it here. For revival to happen. We've prayed it that we want real revival, not just inside our church, but inside our nation. Two billion people plus watch the Super Bowl. The majority of them aren't even watching it for the game anymore. They're watching it for the commercials because they've been worked up so much. If even a third of them, when that commercial is shared, accept Jesus and take the bait and follow up with it. Can you imagine what's about to happen? Like normally I just like, I love the Super Bowl because uh, anti-sex trafficking organizations that I know, that's their big weekend. They get to arrest so many people and rescue so many people. That's still happening this weekend and I praise Jesus when those reports happen, but man, what is going to happen this weekend? When I found about this and found out they made sure it was free for all local churches to be a part of this, because it's one thing to share the gospel. They recognize they need disciples, so they want us to connect. 
We've already had, no, we're at four now. Four people connect with us. The commercial hasn't even aired yet. But part of it was sharing that, like, they go on to Google and go anxiety in churches. And it dings them over to us. And we start talking with them. And what is going to happen with this? Um, I literally, as going through, setting us all up, they were like, we have packets for you. And they're free. I'm like, good. How many can I take? They said 25. Cool. We're taking 25. Um, I must not have been reading what was in the packet. It just said 25 packets to help with this. I thought they were going to be 25 packets with just like these little postcards, the QR code, because I know well enough that there's going to be people watching the commercial and they can't get their phone right to get the QR code to connect to everything. And so I thought I'd be handing out a whole bunch of these this week. Nope. <laughs> a, they, they got a sticker too. Every kid loves stickers. I learned last night also, half the adults in the world love stickers just as much. We got the basic card. So you can get that QR code so you can get to the website so they can connect with churches. But if you guys are doing the leg work, you can just tell them where to go. They got a conversation guide. If you're like, watch the commercial and didn't get it, they got notes in it for you. And tells you what the next steps are. It gives you scripture. It gives you the plan of salvation. I like, okay, yeah, that works too. And then they give you, I know, this is the part I didn't get. I like, this is for the Super Bowl. And I don't mean to be mean, but it's not exactly like the biggest readers in the country watch the Super Bowl. I'm not saying they don't. I'm just like, usually those don't line up. But they got a book from Max Licato that he wrote just for this. And if you've ever read Max Licato, um, he phrases things so well. But it goes over every question that either the church gets accused of, of being judgmental and hating people on, or questions that they know everybody deals with. And they all frame them from what would Jesus do in those scenarios. Like we got, uh, was Jesus ever stressed? Yes. Like that literally happens. He was so stressed out, he sweat blood. Um, what would Jesus think of teen moms? Was Jesus ever lonely? Can I judge without being judgmental? Uh, did Jesus live in poverty? Did he cry? Did he ever mourn? And it, yeah, that's, this is why we have the head thing. Um, yeah, I probably plugged it back in wrong because it came undone. Uh, did Jesus have fun? I can answer that one so easily for you. He hung out with a bunch of fishermen. My family is all fishermen. There's no way Jesus wasn't having fun. Hey, Joey Kane's a Brecken go fishing every Sunday pretty much after church. I'm pretty sure they're only doing that because they're having fun. Because they don't catch fish half the time. And it keeps going on. These are questions... Maybe you don't deal with all of them. Maybe you're not interested in all of them. But people have them. And so we got, like I said, 25 of these packets. If you're like, I'm having people over for the Super Bowl, take a bunch. If you're like, I know who's going to be watching them and I want to connect with them afterwards, take them. Because one of those two realities is happening. You got somebody that you know is going to be watching it. And as much as it sounds weird, I am going to say, as your pastor, try and watch it so you can see what the commercial is too. Even if you don't care about the rest of it, watch for that. And then the final thing here, which weirdly I have to now talk faster, wait for the Holy Spirit. This was from the scripture that Audra read. This is what he's telling to do. Go and wait for the Holy Spirit man, I wish our churches did this part more. I wish we waited for the Holy Spirit more because when the Holy Spirit shows up, that's when things get weird at first. And then, well, actually, they get weird after that too. Every occasion the Holy Spirit shows up in Scripture, it's just weird. And it's the good weird. You have all these people start showing up into faith. You have people giving up everything for everyone so that everyone's provided for. You have all these different weird 
But so good things happen. And right now, um, over at Asbury University and Seminary, because they're kind of on the same campus, they share the chapel. Um, Wednesday, chapel started, and it hasn't ended. Revival has legitimately broken out on that campus. Um, every Wesleyan university that can, I'm pretty sure Kingswood and Houghton might be the only two that don't go because of distance, unless this keeps going, um, have traveled over there. We have, apparently every Nazarene university is traveling up to be a part of this. We are now getting the communication back that it is not just who is on campus, it is who's living in the area or starting to know stuff is going on and coming in and repenting and just healings happening and literally everything that I've read in every book that I've ever had to read on revivals is happening. The only difference between this one and other ones is nobody is giving credit to the first speaker, whereas everything else has been recorded so well that it's a historical fact. This is who started it. Nobody's caring about that, which makes it seem even more like a God thing. I said it last night. Kim's been saying it this morning. Like, both of us are just like, can we just, like, drive up to this? Like, the number of times that revivals have happened, I, there tends to be a gap between them. So it's like... I'm probably going to be dead by the next one unless it flows out and we get to be a part of it in a distance. But here's the nice part. It is already flowing out. One of the universities, Ohio Christian, uh, the report came in this morning that the dad went down to visit his son and he got a phone call saying, you have to come back here because it started here now. And the students that came down from Ohio Christian University hadn't even gone back to campus yet. They were just sharing all the videos and streams. It's going to spread. I won't be surprised. I might not get to go to Asbury tomorrow, but I won't be surprised if I'm up on SWU Wednesday when the students get back and it starts there. We might not be waiting anymore for revival. I know we have a revival service planned for in September. But man, maybe it starts right now. Maybe we don't have to wait to go up to SWU's campus in a couple days when the students come back and start it. What if it just starts right now? An amazing quote was shared with me this morning that we do not pilgrimage to revivals to go because we know Jesus is there. We do not organize revivals because man can never do it. All we do is wait upon the Holy Spirit and when his wind blows, we open our sails. The wind is blowing. Seriously. How can you not say the wind is blowing when a bunch of people that God blessed with money all said over a year ago, we are going to make sure Jesus is at the Super Bowl, the most watched event in this country. And just as we are coming up to it, our universities where our pastors are, are going through revival and the revival is already spreading. God is blowing the wind in every single direction. He's just asking us now, can you open up your sails and be a part of it? And I love that we, knowing nothing of this, changed our service and so that when I'm done talking, altars are open. And if you're like, I can't move because I'm blah, 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 cool. Raise your hands. And if you can't raise your hands, raise your fingers. If you can't raise your fingers, raise your voice. If you need anointed, because part of this Holy Spirit flow is healing, then we're going to do that. And if you're like, I can't get here, then ask somebody to carry you. That was in scripture. Raise your hand. We'll walk. My knees work. Audra's knees work. Kim's knees work. We can walk to you. 
And if you're like, I got to repent, then we have communion open where it's a time where you go, I am taking this in remembrance of you and what you did. That is a time of solemn repentance. But guys, open your sails. Let's let revival start here as we sing. And and I'm... I'm going to flip things a little bit because I want this to be a moment here. Uh, announcements are in the Bolton. Big one. Teens, five bucks. Be here at 4.30. We're going to go to the Super Bowl thing. Uh, the other thing's uh, service project next week. Sign up for it. There's a few slots left. I put the game schedule behind, beside it. Um, but I want these altars flowed enough. We're not even passing around the offering plates. They're up here. Drop it in as worship as you come and pray. But we're going to sing, pray, and revival falls because the wind is already moving and we just need to catch it so come on up feel free to stand or sit most importantly just seeking God in this time responding to him as the spirit leads
All the glory to the name of Jesus. was like, oh my word, how many times am I going to slip off that note? But it was, it's all sweaty and stiff. I should have taken it off between, and I didn't. And I just could not keep my fingers. 